So I would like to welcome um, Lawrence Whittle and Damodar Hedge, as well as uh, Sarah Barnes Humphrey. And um, last but not least, we will have a, a fourth panelist who will join a little bit in later, as far as I've seen and know. It's uh, Jonathan Carelsa, CEO of North Find Management. So, Sarah, nice to, to meet you again. We had the opportunity to see you yesterday. Again, hello everybody. I am really excited to be back here and uh, you know, being on the other side of the mic today, so. Yeah, but uh, you're used to be in front of the mic. So the, the <laughs> feedback to your moderation yesterday, you have stolen me the show, uh, it's uh, really fantastic. <laughs> and uh, that is, that's awesome and that's what we need. So now I'm curious and I hope I can uh, keep up on the moderation level like you did yesterday. So it was really fantastic. So <laughs> now you will be the first one um, being a founder of Ships. Yeah? And then, uh, but nevertheless, I would just like to give the gentleman's just an hello and then the opportunity to say hello back. Damoda. I, I can nice start. Uh, uh, Damo here for short. Um, I'm the supply chain learning lead for uh, Coca-Cola European Partners. This is the world's largest bottler of ho hopefully your favorite drink. Uh, sorry to the competitors out there. Um, <laughs> and yeah, um, but I'm, I'm so I've, I've got a bet with at least one person who's hopefully in the audience that there's not going to be a single ref other reference to Coca-Cola during my presentation. It's about supply chains. It's about sustainability um, and the passion we share and um, Happy to hand over to Lawrence, um, whom I'll very <laughs> likely reference to in my my slide deck. On to you, Lawrence. Yes, um, good afternoon to everyone in Europe. This is Lawrence Whittle. I'm actually uh, based here in Northern California. The sun's just come up over the over the bay, so um, <laughs> early morning here, but great to uh, see you again, Dama. Um, I am a big fan of, uh, obviously, Coca-Cola, and uh, you know, delighted to join the, uh, the session, and I think, um, those that attended my uh, my keynote on Monday um, sort of understand that I have, I have two sort of major passions in business. Number one is for manufacturing supply chain, and number two is for people. I uh, fundamentally believe in the the value of people in uh, in manufacturing supply chain, and looking forward to uh, hearing the presentations, having a good open discussion. So thanks for having me again, Torsten. You're welcome. And last but not least, Jonathan. Hi, welcome. Morning, thanks. Uh, Lawrence, I thought it was me waking up the West Coast, but I'm up here in Vancouver, seeing the sun just coming up as well. Um, I'm excited to be here because uh, I'm a supply chain guy uh, all the way back, and I'm used to doing conferences like this uh, and, and talking about, um, let's say, more typical supply chain issues, talking about organization, talking about um, effective metrics, talking about resiliency, but something that for a long time didn't get nearly enough attention and I think it's been brought into sharp focus lately is uh, risk assessment and de-risking not only supply chain but indeed the entire enterprise. Um, the lack of PPEs early in the COVID crisis had a lot of people suddenly talking about procurement and procurement people became rock stars overnight um, which is fantastic on the one hand but on the other hand I think it illustrates for us just how heinously unprepared a lot of supply chains were for very basic elements of risk. Um, so I know that the, the conference is about supply chain technology first and foremost, and it's, it's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, but I'm very excited to talk today about uh, risk assessment, business continuity management, and a shift in the thinking of uh, who I think should own risk in, in the enterprise. Um, so really happy to be here with all my co-panelists and uh, looking forward to getting, getting into it with you. It's a, it's a perfect match because Sarah also was moderating yesterday uh, a detailed discussion about risk management and now we add upon uh, with your your topic here as well. And so I will hand over the presentation rights now to you, Sarah, and then um, for the audience and everybody, it works like 15 minutes presentation. We will have a 10 minutes discussion slot after your roundabout and then each of um, you are asked to join back in again and discuss along on that panel together and I will try to capture uh, questions from the audience but it's almost about you give each other feedbacks on your presentation and, and, and the audience might get a better key takeaway because of the different aspects and viewpoints from you guys and you can uh, keep your camera open or closed um, just now the stage is yours Dara. Okay sorry I was just getting sorted can you see that? Yep. Yeah, awesome. 
Well, when Thorsten and I were talking about this uh, session, um, you know, usually I'm on the other side of the mic. Now that I've got Ships, our new tech company, um, I wanted to do it a little bit differently. I'm not a PowerPoint presenter, and I really wanted to go into the journey of what it took for me to, you know, get be a tech founder. Um, and also how I became, um, you know, founder and host of the Let's Talk Supply Chain and how the two of them actually intersect. And so this is going to be a little bit of a different presentation for the next 15 minutes. So hopefully you're going to be able to get a lot of value and we'll be able to stir up some conversation um, after, you know, I talk a little bit about where I started. So my journey is, you know, a little bit interesting, obviously, like everybody else's journey. So my father actually owned a private 3PL just outside of Toronto. And so I feel like supply chain is in my blood. We spoke about supply chain and logistics at the dinner table. Um, it was something that as far back as I can remember, we were talking about logistics. And so when, you know, when I was 16, I went to work at the company for summers. And then after high school, I went directly into the family business, started off as reception and really learned every single aspect of what a logistics, what a logistics company actually is and what they do. And I ended up doing all of my designations and diplomas while I was working. So I was able to get on hand experience as well as figuring out what I wanted to do in supply chain. And I feel like that's a really important thing to um, mention because there's so much opportunity in supply chain and you don't really know what is there, what you're good at and what you want to do until you really get into supply chain and see what is out there as far as possibilities and opportunities. And so I was very for fortunate to be able to do that. And so I spent eight years in operations, eight years in sales. In operations, I got to do air freight, ocean freight, warehousing, customs, trucking, you name it, I kind of did, um, I got my hands in everything. So I was able to try all the different aspects of the logistics company. And while I was doing that, I always had side hustles. I'm going to say I always had side hustles and while before I went into sales, I actually realized that, you know, I was terrified of public speaking and if I was going to go into sales, I really had to up my game, but I wouldn't voluntarily uh, sign up for Toastmasters. So I ended up getting a casting agent and I went on auditions. And I got thrown out of so many audition rooms. Like, let me tell you, people threw me out because I wasn't an actress. I really just wanted to get out there and try my hand in front of a camera or in front of a microphone. And it really did help. I ended up on the Home Shopping Channel with Denise Richards, as well as uh, Breakfast Television with Denise Richards as well, which was really, really cool and really helps with my journey and my story and really talking about how you need to try different things to figure out where you wanna be. And then I went into sales for eight years. And after, and during my time in sales, I was able to talk to mid-market importers and exporters about what was going on. What, what did they like about working with a forwarder? What didn't they like about working for a forwarder with, with a forwarder? What were they really looking for from the market? And so I was really able to do a lot of deep dive research while I was also doing sales there. And then I ended up as director of sales and marketing. And when that happened, two things happened that year. One was I realized that there wasn't anywhere that I could tell my story. For freight forwarders and 3PLs, it's very, very important that we're able to showcase what we do differently and how we do it differently and what it means to work with us. And there wasn't anywhere for me to do that. And I was listening to a lot of podcasts at the time and I thought, well, hey, I mean, if you guys know who Lewis Howes is, I thought, well, if Lewis Howes, Howes can do it, I can do it. And so we started the podcast. I had a male co-host and we called it Two Babes Talk Supply Chain, which was just kind of funny. We were just sort of testing the waters and see what the uh, industry would bear. And it ended up picking up. And so I ended up moving that business actually into my own business. And that's how the podcast ended up starting. But also that year, I turned to a friend of mine and I said, I want to get into tech. And they were like, OK, well, what aspect of tech? And I had spoken to so many people, so many shippers, so many importers and exporters. And I was also able to, obviously, with my experience in freight forwarding, um, I was able to understand both sides. And I was like, really, I want to get rid of this. 
I feel like forwarders, I feel like importers and exporters are constantly like this, and I want to get rid of that. So how do we do that? And so we embarked on this journey of the last three years it's been in stealth mode, and that the, the result is ships, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and the last three years have been incredibly eye-opening, and because we've had you know challenges on the tech side, you know, having to find developers. We were top 20 out of 2,000 to be invited to an accelerator program in our very, very early stages. And it came down to the wire, and there was a few things that I didn't like about the accelerator program, so we decided not to go ahead with that, which was a really, really big decision because it would have affected our investment opportunities um, in the future. Um, as a woman in supply chain, you know, trying to get investment, um, which is what I'm I'm currently focused on right now, has been a challenge, right? People invest in people, people invest in people that they they resonate with. And you know, I haven't there's there's a lot of education that needs to be done on in the supply chain space. Is there money for supply chain tech? Absolutely. But there's a lot of education that needs to be done because of you know not really understanding the ins and outs potentially or comparing a ships to somebody else who has nothing to do with ships because of the lack of understanding. And so that has been one of the challenges that um, I faced. The other thing that kind of opened my eyes was the accelerator programs for women. I actually have gone to a multi multitude of them, you know, speaking to them about how to get in, how to work with them, that kind of thing. And one of them that I went to, it was this big launch uh, for this new accelerator program. And I think the total prize was $100,000 over first place, second place, third place, which, and a six month res residency, which is not a lot of money when you're, I mean, it's money that you might need to help build, but it's not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. If you're gonna spend six months in their location, you know, building your business. There's a lot of other, um, there's a lot of other great things about accelerator programs, but that was the one thing that kind of opened my eyes. And a lot of the other times is even to get into these accelerator programs, you need to have revenue. Well, when you're building a tech company, <laughs> you know, you need a lot of money and, um, you know, it's not necessarily that you're going to have revenue just, just to start. So let's get into ships. Um, what is wrong with international shipping? Well, I think that we could probably all agree that there's a lot wrong with international shipping. Um, you know, there's a lot of push-pull between freight forwarders and importers and exporters that there really doesn't need to be. But we've kind of found ourselves in this position of what do we do? We're kind of, you know, moving along day to day as we have been, and nobody's really making any strides to make it any easier on either side. And so that's what we want to do. Um, we are focused on mid-market importers and exporters because we feel like that's where the most um, uh, the most energy needs to be put. We, I feel like the enterprise market has been taken care of with a couple of different marketplaces and also FCL has been taken care of. So we are focusing on full container load, uh, less than container load, as well as air freight, but we're focusing on the mid-market. And what we're doing is we've built a marketplace that actually helps both sides. And so it's not one side over the other. It's something that we are putting together so that both sides can win because we feel like that is where, that's where the success is. If anybody has listened to the Let's Talk Supply Chain podcast, they know that um, my saying is collaboration is the future of business. And so we really need to be able to collaborate to bring the industry together. And so what I learned in a lot of the, including the last three years, I mean, listen, when we started on this path, I was looking to do an Expedia. And then I realized that that's not really what everybody wants. What I realized was that mid-market importers and exporters are still going to three to five different freight forwarders every time they want a quote. And how are they doing that? Well, they're doing that by email, they're doing that by Excel, and it's very, very time consuming. And what happens on the freight forwarder side? Well, the freight forwarders are quoting on every single shipment <laughs> because they don't want to lose a customer, but in the end, they're only getting one to 10% of the bookings. And so there's a lot of wasted space. There's a lot of wasted resources on the freight forwarding side, and it creates resentment. 
right? Because they're quoting on everything and really they might be only good at certain lines, but they feel like they have to because they don't want to lose a customer. And so how do we bring that together? And how do we, how do we make that different? So on the freight forwarding side, what we've done is we've brought in, we've partnered with Sonetta and we've brought in some benchmarking data. And so when the shippers log into ships, they're able to get an estimate. So instead of going to the freight forwarders on every single shipment to get the pricing, they're able to get that estimate real time. The estimate is port to port or it's airport to airport because obviously the X-Works charges and the destination charges, they do change. Um, and, but we're giving them the fundamental of what that estimate could be. And then the idea is that the shipper will only go to the freight forwarder once their shipment is ready. And so the freight forwarder is then able to, or they, they feel better about quoting because that they, they know that the shipment is ready and they know that they you know, have a one in how many chance of, of getting the booking instead of a one in you know, 90 chance maybe of getting a booking. And so the other uh, benefits to the freight forwarder right now is that they currently right now act as a bank. So they act as a bank between the steamship lines or the airlines and the importer or the exporter. So they actually pay the airlines or the steamship lines well ahead of getting paid from the shipper. And the shipper has 30, 45, maybe even 60 day terms. And so they're bridging the gap on the financial side and they're not a bank. That's not what they're in business to do. And so what we've done is we've partnered with Pay Cargo, and Pay Cargo is now giving the, the importer and exporter an option to pay by credit card, ACH, or giving them credit. And um, for the shippers, there's a lot of benefits, right? You've got one login. Think about the multitude of freight forwarders that you might be working with, and think how many logins that you have. I don't know about you, but on, my, on the personal side for me, it's like I have to keep track of them because I must have over 500 passwords. You know, so when you have different freight forwarders and you're working with different freight forwarders, you have different logins. So this ship's uh, platform is giving you one login. Um, it's also giving you one vendor account. By working with Pay Cargo as your vendor account, you no longer have to worry about working with a new forwarder to set up a new vendor account every single time, which is an absolute nightmare. Um, they get transparent pricing. So, um, you know, instead of the Expedia model where it's all posted pricing, you're going to get real time pricing. Um, the benchmarking data that we do give you is updated every single month. So that's still real time transparent pricing and it's a productivity tool. So you're able to be inside of our platform and you're able to keep all of your documents, all of your messaging, everything together in one area for use for that particular shipment. So you can use it as a productivity tool. So basically what we wanted to do was just take what importers, exporters, and freight forwarders were doing together and just put it online. And then it reduces the hours spent on gathering quotes. Um, and we're using the tech um, to also match make. So freight forwarders right now, again, like I said before, they're quoting on everything. Well, what we want to do for them is we want them to narrow down the routes that they want to quote on. So we want them to tell us what they want to quote on. What are they good at? What lanes are you good at? What lanes do you make money on, right? If you're not good on Turkey to Toronto, don't put that, um, don't put that in the system, right? And then we can match make and then everybody wins because the forwarders are being able to work on what they want to be working on. And the importers and exporters, they know that they're getting um, high quality quotes from the freight forwarders that really want their business in those lanes and everybody wins. So we're using tech to match freight with providers, high revenues for forwarders, lower costs for shippers, and so much wasted time back in our days. So I think I'm a little bit early but I figured we could, you know, just start up the conversation if that's okay with you, Thorsten. Absolutely. So a um, um, different way of presenting, I, I highly appreciate because that's exactly what we want, that mixture. Um, it's, it's amazing uh, listening to you and um, yeah, that's what I was expecting also. Okay, uh, good. I wasn't sure. <laughs> I wasn't sure and I'm a bit of a, a storyteller than I am a PowerPoint presenter and I just wanted to make sure that we did something different for the audience today. 
Fantastic. So um, before I also hand over the, the questions to uh, the colleagues here, I just uh, wonder, my, my first question is also, you said, okay, you've grown up with logistics at the uh, dinner table, etc. cetera, but um, how uneasy was it in reality being a, a founder in logistics market um, without revenue as a tech startup as a female as well? Uh, how was the accepting rate at the beginning? Was it more uneasy than, than you now smile and we think about? Well, so I'm still in that stage kind of, right? Because we literal, literally only launched about a month ago. Um, but I can tell you that the last three years have been quite challenging. I mean, it's taken me three years to get to this point. And that's because we've been bootstrapped. Um, I also wanted to do a deeper dive into some of the research and make sure the, the platform that we were putting out there, or the marketplace that we were putting out there is what people want. Right. I didn't want to create something that was five steps ahead uh, that everybody had to learn to use. I wanted to take what everybody was doing right now and just move it online and just make it easier. Okay, and, and it, it rocks. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So yes, it has been a challenge. It really has been a challenge. Um, you know, investment still continues to be a bit of a challenge. Um, but we I have Oof, I've, I've just onboarded some major shippers and we've got some major freight forwarders already on board. So it's a pretty exciting time and it's really only a matter of time. Thank you very much. I'm quite curious because I'm close to a, single, um, a similar situation in a certain way with myself. Well, looking forward okay. to do some private equity, uh, private activities, sorry. Um, yeah, so Damo. Lawrence, Jonathan, any question from your side uh, with regards to Sarah or comments? So, so I'll, this is, yeah, this is, sorry, Dana, you go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Lawrence. I was just going to say, Sarah, um, as a hashtag he for she, I've always found your blog great, the, the, the podcast where you pick up people and then feature their stories. Mm -hmm. And now to be able to share your own story of how you got something done against all odds. That just is 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 like you can do the stuff you talk about. Yeah, and thank that, that's you. a cool example to share with my colleagues. And this is one of the things in supply chain. One of the things we are trying to get in, we will need is to get that diversity in. And I'm not just talking about females. It's, it's being able to use the difference of opinion of everybody we can get on board. Yeah. And uh, you you are a huge 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 uh, <laughs> lead for all of us. Thanks for being that. Oh, thank you very much. That's uh, I. Thank you very much. I mean, that's great to hear. I'm I'm also starting a diversity show on Let's Talk Supply Chain, and that's actually coming out the third week of October. Um, mm -hmm. And it's going to be all about authentic stories because I completely agree with you. I think that we need more impactful, authentic stories from different perspectives, you know, all over the industry, worldwide. And so that's what we're bringing together on that show that's coming up. So I'm I'm excited about that. <laughs> Absolutely, Sarah. We had to. Lawrence, on to you. Thank you. Yeah, great, uh, great overview, Sarah. You know, it, it's interesting when I when I think about what you said about around the, the dinner table. Um, you know, I've spent my whole career in in enterprise technology, but um, my father used to wear a hard hat, and I often say to people, you know, the the the, the fact that I live in live and work in Silicon Valley um, is is a derivative of my sort of upbringing, meaning that I, I saw the opportunity to bring technology into the into the industrial market. And I think it's really, really important to get everyone to realize that there's a lot of perceptions around supply chain and manufacturing in terms of who works there. It's, it's noisy, it's dirty, but in fact, it's, you know, it's, it's often far from that. And I think the diversity in terms of, you know, the obvious subjects, but also just diversity in terms of opinions around, is it a good place to work? So I think that's a, you know, a, a common thread we have, because I think we all know that, you know, the, the demographic shift that's occurring in industry is uh, is accelerating and our ability to actually get just more diversity, get more perception changes, I think it's super important. So I really enjoyed, uh, enjoyed that angle. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would absolutely agree with you. And I think, you know, there's so much opportunity, there's so much possibility that you don't learn everything in school, right? And there's so many different paths that your career can take and it's important to really dive in and get into supply chain or even learn from the people that have been in the industry about the opportunities and the possibilities and what does that look like 
And um, so I, you know, I would agree with you. And it's an exciting time to be in supply chain. I know Jonathan's going to talk about this because <laughs> he mentioned procurement, but it's an exciting time when, you know, you're, they're talking about supply chain on TV every second day. Jonathan, anything from oh. your side? And whoever is sharing the screen, please stop screen sharing as long as we discuss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought someone was about to jump in with a presentation. Um, <laughs> I guess I would just follow on to shamelessly draw a thread to my upcoming presentation and to say that uh, exactly what, uh, what what Damo said earlier, um, diversity, not just for the sake of diversity, but in fact for, for, for risk mitigation and, and for enterprise improvement is, is something that, um, I mean, a lot of people have, or too few people I would say historically have recognized the value of. Uh, in its in its first phase, people began to recognize that it's a thing that maybe should be, from an ethical standpoint, done. But especially as uh, supply chains get globally extended, and through that global extension, we uh, integrate risks from the various nodes in our supply chains. So risk has we find risk in many more sources now, and we find risk with a higher degree of of uh, frequency than we did before. It's, it's specifically in these times of crisis that diversity of opinion and, and, and a really broad and, uh, and uh, deep set of perspectives is, is what helps, uh, first of all, get around the kind of groupthink that we saw historically when boards were dominated by men who looked like each other and thought like each other and thought it was great that they could make decisions very quickly. Um, but the reality is you need the, the, this diversity of perspective in order to, in order to meet these challenges effectively. Um, so it's fantastic. The, the more stories we have like Sarah's and like others that can uh, speak to the value of, um, I hate to say non-traditional, but the reality is supply chain has been traditionally dominated by people who look a certain way. Um, so these, the increase of stories from people who are not what we historically associate with supply chain really helps to emphasize the the value and the need for diversity of thought. But but that also brings in a lot of um, demand or capability growth in the leadership part in, in, in many companies. If you're diverse, not just uh, gender, but um, from mindset, um, um, I can volunteer also for, for you, Sarah, my first uh, job was i'm a trained animal keeper in the frankfurt zoo but i got allergic uh, and uh, so i was supposed to change my job uh, i i had an allergy against disinfection materials so but i learned to practice work so i i have been told only office job okay so i got retrained by government and uh, paid by the company by by the, the the city of frankfurt and so i joined supply chain and i easily observed a hey, this relates to me because as an animal keeper I was learning about um, uh, broad complex thinking in environments you need to see and learn the entire environment of animals etc pp but I also um, walked down to the goods entry and I I was not um, above them I, I grabbed the cardon boxes and we we got them from the pallet and checked the problems yeah because I did my fingers dirty beforehand so and then there I I saw that I have a passion for this as well. And then so I, I grew up in the industry more and more and climbed up the ladder, but sometimes quite uneasy because I have been confronted oft times the higher I came uh, with um, certain management attitudes, very financial driven and not really uh, synergy driven in terms of supply chain. So I had a lot of very inconvenient confrontations uh, with high C-level management throughout my career, to be honest. Huh? So that is the other point that um, we always claim and say this should and must be, and that's the future, but we need to support those people because it's an uneasy way. Yeah, and we need to create that path, right? We need to show them what that path looks like and, and what they need to be doing and what or where, the, where do they want to be in their career, right? What does that look like? Is that a C-suite level? You know, because I didn't really have I had some, but I didn't have a lot, you know, um, helping me on that path. And so I think, you know, when we when we think about having more diverse perspectives, we need to be more intentional about what that looks like, how we can support them, what are the opportunities as well that they can have just as well as us. But I wanted to ask, any comments on the tech? <laughs> We're talking about diversity, but I really did talk about it. 
some technology. <laughs> we can come back to oh. that also later. <laughs> Namuda. Exactly. As I was going to say, the, um, the, the tech stacks are, I think, is interesting. I, I didn't see in the presentation what, what, what the USP would be because we use a lot of similar systems here. But I think if, if we started off on that, we are going to have an hour long but very yeah, good discussion around it. But I guess <laughs> Thorsten is inviting us after to catch up on All what right, we yes, do next. So, so I'm keeping up that for, for later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so then we'd maybe, just, mm -hmm. so maybe you, you just start with your presentation then, Damodar, and we come back okay, to, I'll the, try to the save us time for, for the dinner later, as Lawrence would call it. <laughs> <laughs> no, excellent. Um, so yeah, so tech stack, I'll put that on an action list of pending things to do later. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, we're gonna go a little bit back uh, big picture. We're not gonna go into um, some of the important themes like diversity, etc. cetera, because um, so um, it's, 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 it's going to be a short 15 minutes, but these are what I call impressions. Um, over a lifetime in, in the supply chain. Um, getting from being an engineer, I, I, I trained to be a robotics engineer and certainly found that uh, when I finished my engineering studies, there weren't many companies in the country where I did that uh, who needed my skills. So I moved out, um, worked for a couple of uh, conglomerates, Procter & Gamble and Unilever among them, where I basically worked my way out of engineering across, uh, like Thorsten would call it, to being being a customer service and planning professional. Um, when you're good at fundamentals and analytics, I always send you back into operations excellence. And uh, that's where Lawrence and me cross paths because once we had achieved a certain level of operations excellence, leapfrogging was only possible through digital methods. And uh, that's where, Sarah, I'd come back to you on. I think that the platform you're building on is, is, is building on very healthy fundamentals. And, and the part, the digital key is always what takes a core idea and makes it so huge and so impactful that it's absolutely difficult to stop it from succeeding. And uh, in today's capacity, um, in, as, as, as a learning lead, um, I call myself a supply chain talent maker. Um, I look at role models like Sarah, role models like uh, Thorsten, who are crossing industries, crossing through what we call established lines of supply chain. Um, and, 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 and creating new possibilities, whether it's entrepreneurial, uh, whether it's intrapreneurial within companies, or if, it, if it's just game changing like Lawrence company is doing by, by providing organizational um, frameworks around which we can improve existing processes. So um, first things first, I think we need to agree on the definition of what we are talking about, because when I talk sustainable, I'm not talking about the sustainable growth rate, which the finance guys talk about about not taking on more depth than you can actually handle. Um, I'm talking about when you are transforming, can you transform in such a way that you don't burn out the organization, that you don't burn out the people, that you don't burn out the supply chains, right? I think, uh, John, when you're talking about, um, about about the speed of response that was needed when, when, when the crisis came in, um, that comes to how fast can you go without the doctors and the healthcare professionals burning through? And, and, and that's mostly been the decision behind what level of lockdowns you have needed. Some of them have not been all the best decisions, um, but the transformation part will come in just a second. What do we want to transform supply chains for? But the clue around sustainable has always been around go at the fastest rate you can afford to, but not faster than you can, um, you can, you can keep the checks coming out. Um, I think Justin Trudeau said it um, quite pertinently. As far as the change is concerned, the external pace of change, that's just speeding up. Um, stuff which you have heard in this whole conference, by the time we get around to the next session, Thorsten, next year, hopefully, uh, many of these things would already be obsolete. They'll no longer be game changers. They'll probably be ideas that have been tried and tested, and if not found wanting, have become regular business. Justin um, Trudeau's insights have been more than offset by his tax policy, just as a Canadian. <laughs> John, you can say that. As, as a North American, <laughs> you guys probably have a better view of that. But I think uh, the whole point I'd make around speed of changes, um, if you made a mistake, you can revise it faster than in previous lifetimes. 
right? If, if you had a supply chain in 1920s, uh, before the world wars came around, if you had set up a strategy, you needed 50 years before you could change that. Today, you could put in a tax policy, admit that it was wrong, and six months later, have it slightly different policy, and it would still be acceptable because the rate of change is just going up. Um, the tough part is that the external change, the ones that we cannot influence, the ones that concerns us but isn't necessarily in our area of influence. I don't know um, how far you guys' political connections go, but I don't think any of us can actually influence guys like Justin or, um, or, or, or um, uh, the European leaders except for going out and putting our votes in. But what is certain is all change that's coming in is, is volatile. Um, this is this 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 is a very military term um, from 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 Warren Bennis and Bert Nanos, but I think they struck the chord right when it came to you can you can take anything you can take Corona you can take climate change any of those big changes coming in they are uncertain you cannot model them in math uh, you cannot predict them um, you see the whole complexity around them they don't have it's not a single variable math. And they're also ambiguous, stuff that we think might be good today. Uh, we think electric cars might be good, change it around. You don't get the cobalt uh, extraction right. It becomes literally the opposite of anything but sustainable. And some of those questions are just not just complex, they're also ambiguous. And therefore the question is, if we as, as, as a supply chain community had one goal that was worth transforming around, worth transforming for, uh, worth pushing to, I think uh, the answers were defined uh, a little over a year ago when, when, when the UN brought around their sustainable development goals. Thorsten, you told me we, we do have a session tomorrow which goes into a bit, little more of detail around these. Yes, yes, we will have Anne Rosenberg tomorrow. She's co-founder of the SDG Ambition and there will be the next level of, of implementation and she will refer to that in her keynote tomorrow. Yeah, and so I wouldn't steal any of that thunder. Um, other than to say, um, when I think of the Godfather, uh, the one statement that always comes up is, um, I'll make, an, make you an offer that you can't refuse. Those 17 goals, I think, are, are, a, are a common set of goals, no matter in which business you are, no matter in which level of management you are at, no matter your current level of mastery of your field. Um, you can look at those 17 goals, pick one, and I say, I can identify with that. I think I can play a role in that and I can use my work in the supply chain to have an impact on at least one of those goals. And I think no matter what kind of VUCA change comes in, uh, if you had that common set of beliefs, we literally will be able to do business across all of our partners. So when, 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 we, when we talk about a manufacturing supply chain or a logistics supply chain, you always have several partners who are collaborating. You have technologies that help us to collaborate. You have processes that help to define how the collaboration takes place. You have the organization to support that collaboration. And then you have the participants. And when we talk about those people, if we had to look back in 2030, in that year's conference, I think this would be a good chart, Thorsten, where you could look back and say, 10 years ago, we looked at it with Anne Rosenberg and asked ourselves, how are we gonna get there? And where are we at now? Uh, and these goals wouldn't have changed. All the other VUCA influences would have changed. The technology might have moved on. Uh, something would have, would have might have happened in, in, in terms of the participants of uh, this conference, but um, these would be worth the objectives too to shoot for. So that's that's where the sustainable transformation comes in around. Literally every employ, employer I've been working for over the last 20 years has had these common goals. And I think this is the first time I'm seeing across organizations, across countries, across companies, we have that alignment that there are certain parts of this list that we absolutely say, okay, that that's absolutely in our area of influence. We're gonna do something about it. And uh, watch out for tomorrow's session around it um, i'm gonna go to the to the easy bits so as i said my task today was uh, as i agreed with thorson is to come in challenge you guys on what you have been listening to the last um, two and a half three days including today and try to see if if we can get a framework around how you can use what you've taken out of out of the learnings including tomorrow and put them back in your workplace 
um, and these are the three questions you should ask yourself what are you doing around the process what are you doing around your organization what can you do around the organization and 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 how's the impact landing on the people including yourself so let's 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 start with the process i think uh, the the previous sessions we we heard a lot of um, lean uh, we had a lot around blockchains um, yesterday we had around stuff around artificial intelligence about about how um, RFID and I think Lawrence, you have you had been there on day one, around around how systems can help. But in the end, all those processes we talk about, uh, just like machines convert one form of energy to another form, processes convert inputs to outputs. So you might have a purchase order that creates a product that needs to be shipped. Uh, you might have information which you which you put into the ship's database that then makes customers aware that the shipment is coming in late or it's coming in early or it's going to cost them more or it's going to cost them less. Um, those inputs creating outputs are those processes. The better you understand this, the better you can model those frameworks in your mind, the better you can get to the point of getting the cost right and cost doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be the monetary cost it can also be just as well carbon um, environmental impact um, impact on society the cost of what you need to use it could just be energy um, the service and service i think is the most important part of the triangle because this is where your paying customer comes in um, there's a lot of buzzwords around employee experience etc uh, in the end the service is about can you delight the customer are they getting what they're looking for? Are they, are if, if, if they're using blockchain for transparency, is the data coming in in such a way that in the end, uh, the output, which in one case might be transparency, is that reliable? Is, is the customer satisfied with that service? And then you have stock, which is about what do you need to hold in your system? Uh, what buffer do you need to hold in your system? Is it data you're holding? Is it inventory you're holding? Um, is, it, is, it, is, is it cash you're holding in order to be able to, to work and deliver on, on your customer's needs? those that triangle you can influence best when you understand your process you understand your manufacturing process you understand your changeovers you understand um, what your changeover matrix looks like the better you can deliver in terms of having a, 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 a run strategy that gets you best cost or the highest flexibility and all of these can be condensed into knowledge models this is what we call them from 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 the learning angle we call them they are literally shortcuts, um, sets of methods, um, groups of ways of working, uh, all different names. The, the Toyota um, product uh, uh, system, the lean systems for for it, it extends all the way into software development. You have world class manufacturing, which is more the the financial view of TPM. In 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 the end, it is about how do you observe your process? How do you critically think it down to its fundamental processes and then achieve excellence? And excellence is something you define. It could be cost, it could be service, it could be keeping minimum stock, um, keeping products moving fast. And these are all different shortcuts to get to the same destination. But what I'm telling you is all that you've heard in the last three days and what you'll hear tomorrow, try to sort it out to understand what's process and which of these processes you want to master. Because as a supply chain professional, unless you master those processes, you're not going to be able to improve them and besides improving you will also need to adapt them to your organization and um, this is something i need to connect to my uh, role as a, as, a, as a digital supply chain lead uh, and lawrence knows what i'm talking about we run a hell of a lot of small projects um, this year is corona budget is tight so we're not doing that many but last year we were running double digit number of small projects to test things everything from temperature sensors predictive maintenance um, all the way to to integrated business planning we assume it's 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 a it's a, it's a very silicon valley mindset at least two of you sitting on in, in this panel would understand what i'm talking about we assume that those things are not gonna work our target is not to succeed our target is to learn fast enough to be able to have the other projects succeed widely from from those learnings and if I had to distill two learnings around organization, and then um, this is this is the one thing I can talk about when I say about when you're an intrapreneur, when you're working in a large company, or you're working with several layers of management above you, your only chance of having an impact or digital transformation or any other transformation you want to have is 
you need to engineer the environment. You need to make it easy. You need to make it error proof. And, and this is a link you'll hear from Lawrence in a bit um, around where can you get systems in place? Where can you get checklists in place? which make it easy for a worker to basically come in and say basically these are the things i usually do but i still have a checklist that tells me what i'm going along and i think um, atul gawande says it nicely in, in his in his um, book around the checklist manifesto he says the difference between the airline industry and the health industry is the airline industry has got a culture that basically integrates checklists they're egoless when I, when, I, when a first officer asks his captain have you checked the flaps the the, the the captain answers yes and he doesn't think about is he being challenged or is it that is that a checklist you go to a hospital you often have a case if a nurse asks doctor have you forgotten your your, your scissors your surgical scissors in the patient the doctor gets hmm i'm an experienced doctor you can't be asking me that question just because that checklist doesn't exist makes that error rate go up that means that environment was not engineered well enough the other learning i've had from digital projects which didn't go well where the idea was correct where we could make it easy to work error proof was that did we get those decision makers to have an experience that had a positive net promoter score if they had if they sat in um, if, 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 if they looked at a planning desk and said okay demand sensing is giving us better data coming in from the point of sale and we can actually see that that's an event happening somewhere in a certain postcode and we can rush inventory to that. If it's not visual, if it's not memorable, they're not gonna talk about it, which means it's very difficult for them to come back and say, okay, that's the technology we're gonna invest in. And making that experience promotable takes work. And this is something in supply chain we are traditionally not good at. Uh, we are not necessarily, we haven't usually thought out the marketing aspects of, of our good ideas and therefore often we miss the chance to influence the organization to pick up those improvements in the process that we are asking asking for and and and, and i think that's that's the second framework out I'd, I'd share with you guys um, and Dhamma? the last one so Thorsten, we are, i think that's the last minute isn't it yeah already okay um this one is a quick one um when we talk about people let's start with you if you master your process, if you can continuously improve, anybody who needs an example of that just needs to go and look at uh, battery days recording from yesterday evening or yesterday, uh, you would see what, what continuous improvement is. You need to believe that you can do better. You need to be able to go back and improve it. Uh, think for the long term, but be ready to move fast. And uh, one ask for you as, as part of this community, as part of the attendees of this conference, find one other person in the community that you want to work with that you can support so as to say when you need a friend be a friend and i think uh, sarah this, i'm borrowing this from you i think um, collaboration is the future of business collaboration is also the future of supply chains um, so those will those will be the three things i would give to you guys and back to you thorsten but that is a perfect uh, <laughs> Point because I noted that down and I forgot uh, to point that out with Sarah earlier. And I recently did a presentation in uh, ICA Indonesia along with Efrata Yunus, who did moderation today, where I was talking about true collaboration as a future for supply chain because that's the topic. But that goes along not just in technology, it is also a question of leadership. If we go through the value chain, we need to yep. step out of our silo as a company. And that yeah. becomes even more uneasy because even within a company, sometimes it does not work. I, I have only one example that it is sometimes uneasy to reach out to the own CEO and they're asking him a question. It's easier to reach out to Jonathan through the LinkedIn network, who is the CEO of another company. Yeah? So that's <laughs> weird. Yeah? And, and <clears throat> these are the points. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just have one question and then I would love to hand over to, to Sarah, Sarah and, and Jonathan and maybe we can also discuss a little bit about uh, technology and Lawrence as well. Um, you have had a lot of topics in there, but um, you said you believe that next year a lot of these things we are now discussing as um, potential game changers, next year they are standard. Um, are you serious? I say I doubt that. As long as we don't have that what you have shown with sustainable goals implemented in all companies i as a supply chain manager haven't seen them before in yep. uh, my companies brought down to my level 
never ever. Yep. It is soft facts or whatsoever, nice reporting to the finance, but as long as that part is dominating, we will go back to where we have been as long as one factor is dominating. Cash is king, this short-term orientation, this is mm -hmm. done. This will not work, otherwise the next pandemic, the next crisis, we will be there where we were. Mm -hmm. now. I'd challenge that in a different way, Thorsten. I would say let's let's look at the the, the law of averages. When we talk about the current systems, um, I think in, in 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 the current multinational corporations, you're talking about these silos where we are we are seem to be moving slowly. They are influencing between half a million to a billion people across the world. I think for the other six billion who are participating at the edge of all of these developments that change in one year gets faster. I know we tend to look at egocentrically and we look at what is happening in Europe or in North America and we believe that's that. But if you go back to Y2K in 1999 and what people used to believe would happen when, when the date changed to four digits, the year would change to four digits, um, those changes happen so fast. Looking back, it seems like, what the hell did they spend a whole year worrying about? That's a couple of lines of code today. And I think that's happening. Our perception of it changes. Yeah. I'm with you on that one. We might not perceive it as, as rapid, but if you look at uh, uh, battery driven cars, they are here. They're just not affordable. Right. And and I think uh, just because it's not affordable doesn't mean that it's it's cutting edge. Sarah, do you want to join in here? Yeah, I, I made quite a few notes, actually. I thought that that was great. Um, I think just going to your point, I was interviewing somebody last year, and he said that the knowledge base is changing every 1.5 years, and that was last year, and it's only going to get faster. And so, you know, it'll be interesting to see what that means. On your sustainability point, um, I obviously have taken a look at the SDGs, and I think it's important to note that People need to take a look at the SDGs and just figure out where you can impact. Yes. Like that's just where you start, right? Just start yep. where you can impact. Take, and I think that's kind of what you were saying is that just take one of those SDGs that is yep. the easiest for you to implement as an organization and to make an impact there and then move out from there once you get a little bit more comfortable with what that looks like and what changes that you need to make to processes and different things like that. I think the other important thing to note about that you know, I've spoken to a lot of non-for-profits and it's not all just about money either. It's also about our expertise in supply chain. There's a lot of non-for-profits out there that need our expertise and just need our time to be able to provide that to them from a supply chain and logistics perspective, potentially. Um, I liked what you said about checklists and I think you're completely right about innovation. I mean, we need to get a lot more comfortable with being uncomfortable by taking new ideas and new suggestions and innovation and trying it and being okay with failing. Because the yeah. only way forward is for us to really be able to take those good ideas, whether they're good or, or bad, we don't know until we actually move that forward and, and see if it will make an impact. Um, and I think we need, as supply chain uh, companies and professionals, we need, to, we need to get better at being comfortable with failing. But the one question I do have for you is, mm -hmm. what do you think we need from C-suite to support in some of those initiatives? You know, depending on where you are in the organization. Yeah. I you know, think I it's think happening, right? The, the C-suites are getting more comfortable talking directly with, with the whole organization. They're literally seeing that as a, as a requirement for all future leaders of organization. Uh, we talk about it as, I'm quoting one of my um, managers in the past, um, leadership is a contact sport. And, and you have a lot of CEOs basically saying, I want everybody in the organization to have a mobile device that I can mail them and talk with them and get feedback from them. So you have on one hand, you have Clint and all this um, feedbacks, employee service that happening. On the other side, you also have CEOs basically standing up and saying, okay, I need to talk to my people, um, even if it's a virtual town hall, if, if, if it's COVID. So, so that's happening. I think... Um, the, the whole C suit hierarchy is also kind of disintegrating, and we have to thank the entrepreneurs for that because you can see that the millionaires and the entrepreneurs they they have been able to capture the value on the market without being subservient to any corporate hierarchy, right? So we might we might be seeing the sunset of many of these hierarchical systems. Um, so so that's changing. 
It so might take more than one and a half years, I, but yeah. I was with so you until the disintegration of hierarchy, <laughs> Demo. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I just wanted to hand over to you, Jonathan, because I think I see it in your face. If you want to comment on that, it is. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, the, the last 30 seconds have generated a number of little bullets for me. Um, <laughs> Thanks, you know, so, so a couple of things I want to follow on from um, the rate of change. I mean, Sarah's already uh, reinforced that. Um, I, I have nothing new to add other than to say um, I'm working on a book right now, which we're expecting to, to publish in the spring, which traces major milestones in the development of business forecasting. Um, and, and even if you look at where these milestones fall on that timeline, you yep. know, we've got millennia between the first couple, we've yep. got centuries between the next couple, we've got decades between the next few, and the last few chapters are like every year. Um, and we're seeing it everywhere. I mean, it's been, you can look to any branch of human knowledge and human learning and, and see that our capacity for expanding the body of knowledge is, is expanding. What isn't expanding is our capability or, or, or the neural structure we have for actually absorbing that. So what's, what's becoming almost more important than the expansion of that knowledge is the capacity for accessing and leveraging that knowledge. I mean, a hundred years ago, you didn't have the issue of being overwhelmed by the total corpus of knowledge that was out there. Now you could spend a lifetime studying a subset of a subset of a subset of a branch of knowledge. So yeah. it, it, the metadata is almost more important now than the data. That's an interesting conversation from a tech standpoint, but even from a governance standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, collaboration is another one I wanted to follow on. Strongly agree. Um, mm -hmm. MIT Sloan has done work for, for at least 50 years around the need for collaboration in supply chain. And, and many listeners and probably my co-panelists are familiar with the beer game. Um, this isn't like beer pong. This is a supply chain exercise. Uh, but one of the takeaways when MIT Sloan reprised it in the 80s, uh, when they unblinded every other round so that all the participants knew what the data was, there was still this hedging effect and there was still all this supply chain waste because human nature or we're, we're conditioned in traditional supply chain to be distrustful of the people on either side of us in the supply chain either because we think they're stupid or because we think they're trying to cheat us <laughs> and the data has shown emphatically that the more that we can engage with our upstream and downstream partners even if we feel like we're giving away a competitive advantage by being more transparent in fact it's been proven that we're all going to be more profitable over time um, Checklist is, is a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I don't talk about risk a lot, uh, and I'll talk about why in my presentation. One thing I'm talking a lot about now is not really as a foil to technology, because I think there's a lot of people talking about it, but as a, as a synergistic approach, um, behavioral economics is a thing I'm very excited about in, in decision making. And, and the more we learn about how the human mind makes decisions, the more we understand why the airline industry got it right by putting checklists in place. Um, we, we can be tempted to think that uh, going through a rote exercise like this is demeaning to us or, or somehow calls into question our, our, our capability, but in fact, it safeguards against the known frailties that we have as humans. Absolutely. Maybe See, I, just, I just can give Lawrence also a chance before we come over to the next presentation to comment on that as well. Okay, so, then, that so, so many point from you, Jonathan, because I think there were some parts in what you said, access to, to, to leverage know-how and all these kind of things. And, and uh, with the sea level um, topic, uh, we have been brought up by, by Sarah. I think the two points uh, directly relate to you, uh, Lawrence, with access to know-how in the plant and, and the people what possible is doing. And then at the same time, your sea level like uh, Jonathan as well. So, Yeah, it's... Um... Torsten, I don't know whether you deliberately figured out how to get this panel together because the I know you did, but it's it's almost uh, bizarre how interrelated all these subjects are. The re reason I say that is, you know, if you think about uh, the, co the context of sustainability and, you know, there's a skepticism about will people really buy into it. But let me tell you, the case is closed. OK, the world has voted. Um, I sit in California. It's burning terribly this year. We've got to change. There's no debate anymore. It's just how fast you can do it. Exactly. The reason why I think there's going to be a massive acceleration is that there's increasingly an understanding from the investment world. You can actually make money out of being sustainable. Exactly. So if you think about you know, Coca-Cola and you think about single-use plastic and the thing that's driving 
once you get this moving, you can actually make money out of it. So that's the first point. It's no longer a debate. Um, and the reason no longer it's a debate is that uh, currently it's estimated that 71% uh, of the industrial workforce, which is supply chain and manufacturing, are in their late 50s. Okay, so they're over 50. The next generation which is coming in, which is millennials and Generation Z, they've already voted. Okay, so if you don't change, let me tell you, you are out of business in terms of sustainability. The second point, which I think is really important, the most efficient thing you can do to drive sustainability is to become more productive. There is so much waste in supply chain and manufacturing still after decades of e effort. So you know, just being becoming more, more efficient, I think is important. And then in terms of, I, I'm really with Damo in terms of, you know, next year, like this year has been, you know, the pandemic has been traumatic for everyone. People are in a holding position, but the pent up demand for people to get better next year, I think once people see the perspective, the investment that's going to go on in digital technologies is going to go through the roof because people are seeing already during the pandemic the value. You know, in, in January, there was 11 million users a day of Microsoft Teams. It's now over 40 million. OK, <laughs> the benefits of being able to collaborate real time. And, you know, the, the other thing which is you know, challenging for me as a CEO, you know, I, I'm certainly... Um, a people person, but you have to learn new skills and, you know, CEOs need to communicate. So I do think there's a really interesting, uh, you know, sort of thing that's occurring out of the pandemic, which has really made people really th rethink how they operate. And the final point about, you know, we'll talk about checklists because I think there's a, it's an amazing uh, synergy here around this discussion. But one of the benefits of digital is it can give you in the moment, like in the palm of the hand, what you should do next. Humans are typically very motivated to do things correctly, but there's stress. How did I do it, et cetera. The benefit of you know, digital now is you, you can give people in the moment guidance. Um, you can collaborate with people that could be a subject matter expert over the other side of the plant. So I think you've also got this you know, emerging recognition that some of these technologies actually can make a massive difference without a lot of effort. The problem with the last 25 years of supply chain management software it takes open heart surgery to deploy. It takes three years, and by the end of it, we're all exhausted. But the benefit now of some of these technology, you can literally implement, you can start tomorrow. And I think that's the other, people are just thinking differently. To that Absolutely. point, you're allowed to come back with your presentation, I know, so we don't want to um, <laughs> give too much insights too early. And now I think um, that's a perfect handover also to, to Jonathan. Um, so it's your turn, Jonathan, to present the next 15 minutes, and then we come yep. back for discussion and to continue. Thank you. Excellent. All right. So um, it seems like uh, all of my co-panelists have, have tried to avoid long presentations, as have I, uh, especially for the attendees who have been through um, three days of, of uh, presentations. You don't want to see a, a long PowerPoint deck. So I'm going to try to keep this as pithy as I can and, and allow us enough time to, uh, to focus on conversation afterwards. Um, I think it is worth pointing out really quickly uh, a little bit about my also unconventional path to supply chain because I think it um, it sort of underscores why things like risk and governance are maybe more in focus for me than some of the colleagues that I've worked with in the past. Um, my background was econometrics and law before studying value chain as part of my uh, MBA at MIT Sloan. And, and I did that because I was in a, a governance role at a Japanese automotive manufacturer uh, who'd agreed to sponsor the MBA. And uh, I asked, hey, since you're paying for it, um, is there a specific area you'd like me to focus on? And at the time, we were really being hammered by supply issues. So uh, my boss said, hey, if you can figure out a way to fix our supply issues, that'd be fantastic. So I focused on value chain, which was honestly the the first real exposure I had to it, but I loved it. Uh, to me, it was like the, the syncretism of, um, of, of governance and of economics and, uh, and, and really seemed like it had, uh, it, it was the levers that could really drive change in an organization. Um, from there, I've spent the rest of my career in supply chain. And, and one of the things that uh, one of the things that we've been doing in my organization over the last 10 years is interim governance. And uh, I was in a role as an interim COO and CFO with one of our clients uh, for the last five years, ended in, in June. 
Um, so I actually got to live through um, that pre-COVID period where uh, we look really prescient because we were focusing on putting a risk assessment policy in place just as COVID hit. Uh, and then to see, you know, what, what that daily impact of COVID looked like. What I want to talk about today is really, I hope, casting a broader net on what is risk in an organization. Because I think a lot of us are already very well conditioned to understand you know, the, the potential, hopefully far-fetched, of, of cataclysmic events like uh, the tsunami at Sendai or uh, COVID-19 or the, the, the port strike in Los Angeles or the port strike in Santiago de Chile. There's, there's tons of examples over the last 20 years, but most of us have, have up until this truly global pandemic been able to put risk off of our short-term plans by trying in an informal way to, to weigh up the probability of whether or not something like that would happen to us. And the reason is, when we talk about risk and we talk about risk assessments and business continuity planning, we're talking about something that takes a lot of effort. It, it often costs money. It certainly costs time, but there's no immediate P&L impact. So it's a thing that we like to put off because there are other projects vying for our attention in the short term, which may have a P&L impact. The best case scenario you can be looking for when you're engaging time and, and resource into risk management is that something bad happens and because you had a policy, you mitigated the effect. And there's, there's rarely a time in a corporation's life that there is enough um, excess capital that someone can come to the board and say, hey, I wanna spend a bunch of money on something that we hope probably will never happen, but if it does, it'll be less expensive if we do something about it which is essentially what we're talking about with risk management. But the reality is COVID-19 for a lot of organizations has now changed that, that conversation. It, it's made it clear that, like I was talking about earlier, globally extended supply chains have introduced levels of risk to organize, organizations that didn't exist in the past. And irrespective of the size of an organization, there is, I will argue, a fiduciary responsibility for corporate governance to have risk management and business continuity planning as cornerstones of their corporate policy. So just a couple of interesting stats to get underway. Um, study by Mercer showed that, uh, this is pre-COVID, 51% of companies around the world had no plans or protocols in place to combat a global emergency. And uh, EY's Global Board Risk Survey, which was also done late last year, illustrated that only 21% of board members they talked to thought their organizations were very prepared to respond to an adverse risk event. Um, in my experience, I would say even this, this Mercer study might be optimistic. There are organizations who, especially if they're public, are required to tick a box around risk management. But when you actually looked at the capability of organizations to respond to uh, the COVID crisis, they were immediately exposed as woefully underprepared. So I want to talk first about what is risk. Uh, like I said, you know, a lot of us think about risk in these cataclysmic terms. It's a global pandemic. Uh, it's uh, it's a tsunami. It's a volcano. It's it's a port strike. But in fact, risk in an organization is much more pervasive than that. Um, risk is is any of those things that stand between you and the achievement of your goals, and it's that degree of probability that you don't achieve them. And these can be your financial goals operational goals, which is the type that those of us in supply chain are most uh, familiar with talking about, and our strategic goals. And when you think about risk in these terms, it really begins to change the conversation. It changes the conversation not only in terms of how prepared are we, but it changes the conversation in terms of who should be responsible for it. Um, just recently, as some of you may have read um, the report from FinCEN uh, around some of the banks that uh, have been repeat offenders over STRs or suspicious transaction reports um, like Deutsche Bank, uh, HSBC, Mellon. These are organizations where, uh, with all due respect to any employees who may be on the call, it appears that the culture of, of risk appetite demonstrates that they have actively weighed what 
the probability of being caught looks like, what the cost of that penalty looks like, and what the upside of going about what they're doing anyway looks like. And that's really what the math around risk can look like in, in any part of the business. It isn't just what do we do in the case of one of my main suppliers going down, it's where are all the sources of my risk and what can I do to mitigate against that? Or in fact, should I mitigate, mitigate against some of that risk? Because is the cost of mitigation and is the cost of it happening actually going to outweigh what the enterprise impact is going to be? So risk isn't the same as uncertainty. It includes uncertainty, but it also includes those types of, of risk for which we know the eventuality is certain. We're just unsure of the time. Um, the, the next quote I'm going to put up actually illustrates that very well, although it comes from a kind of a dubious source. Um, and when Rumsfeld said this uh, in the early 2000s, a lot of people laughed. But in fact, um, his take on, on knowns known unknowns and unknown unknowns is actually now being quoted by, by HBR. So I think uh, I, I'm going to appropriate it as well. I think it, it, it encapsulates how we look at risk perfectly. There are known knowns, and these are the things we know that we know. These are the risks that we've seen happen before and that we can, we can approximate the impact of and we can take countermeasures against. Then there are the known unknowns. So these are the areas we know are out there that we don't have enough insight into that we can throw resource at and try to understand more about, but we're aware of them. But then there's things like COVID and the response to it that Taleb would call a black swan. Um, you can call it whatever you want, but this is a thing that we didn't know we didn't know. I mean, we knew there were going to be pandemics. We have lots of experience with that, but we had no idea what the scope of the impact of this particular pandemic was going to be. And it's understanding these three categories of risk that really is, is a key component of effective business continuity planning. Put in a, in a longer way, uh, when we're talking about risk, we're talking about the collective activities of the organization to define, detect, manage, and report all operational risks. And this includes strategic, financial, and increasingly reputational risks. I say increasingly because the more social that we become as organizations, the more quickly our customers can respond to a communication misstep. So this is an area where we really need to be mindful as well. Operational risk is defined as the risk of loss resulting from people, inadequate or failed internal processes and systems or from external events. And finally, operational risk is inherent in all products, activities, processes and systems. And this isn't just within our four walls. We need to be really mindful of the fact that we integrate risk with anyone with whom we interact on the outside. Business continuity management is that set of activities that we uh, undertake to mitigate against that risk. Um, and I mean, it, it's, it's a very big idea. I'm trying to convey, convey this in a couple of minutes. And, and the uh, ISO 22331 document on, on BCM is long and complicated. I've tried to sort of distill it down into an easy diagram here. But essentially, when we look at any of the different parts of the business, whether these are functional areas or whether these are levels of reporting, there are seven key components of BCM that we have to look at when we assess the risk and when we, we look at countermeasures in the event of the risk happening. So in terms of governance and policy, do we have policies in place that effectively safeguard against the possibility of this happening? And if it does happen, do the policies capture what those scenarios look like? Have we effectively done a business impact analysis? So in other words, do we understand how long the enterprise could continue running in the eventuality of this type of risk occurring? Do we have a crisis management plan in place? So when the risk occurs, do people know what they're supposed to be doing? Because uh, the last thing you want is for the crisis to hit and uh, people to be having to react on the fly. We as humans have, have demonstrated many times that we're not very effective in this type of situation. Once we understand the BIA and have the, the CMP, what is the business recovery plan? Once the crisis has passed and we're rebuilding, what, what's our fastest path back to status quo? Increasingly, an IT disaster recovery plan um, forms a cornerstone of every one of these because as we become more tech and data reliant, we become more susceptible to risks transmitted through IT as well and data. 
Third party risk and contingency management is critical. And when we think about the shortage of PPEs, those of us in supply chain, I'm sure some of us, if you're like me, were scratching your heads a little bit when you learned that hospitals were gonna be running out of masks. I mean, yes, demand had increased dramatically, but to hear that a lot of these health authorities only had a single supplier runs contrary to everything we know about procurement best practices. And this is a clear risk. If you're doing an effective BCM program, you've looked at third-party risk in every one of your key areas. And then finally, your people management and communication plan is, is critically important. Again, as we become more and more social, being able to convey to the market very quickly uh, what your intentions are is, is key. I have uh, another 30 seconds, Thorsten. I can't see you, but if that's you making a noise because my time is up, I'm nearly done. Um, if it sounds like there's a lot of uh, risk we have to manage, there, there, actually, there obviously is. We can't do it all, and we can't do it all effectively. So keeping a risk management heat map up to date is, is key. It's, it's, a, it's a key governance exercise that all of your uh, corporate leaders should be looking at. Understanding that matrix between the severity of these risks in your various departments and what the probability of these risks is and managing what matters. So starting with the extreme and moving to the high, and then if you have resource, being able to look at some of those other areas. So at the end of the day, you, you've, you've heard that risk can impact many more parts of the business than just these catastrophic events. And this is why I'm arguing that this traditional model where Business continuity management exists as a subset of operations, as either a team or an individual role or a person should, as a best practice, be moved up to management and, and be part of the, the fiduciary responsibility, not only of every leader, but actually ingrained in the culture of the business. The more that the culture of the business becomes focused on risk management, the more that we're able to take these countermeasures early and prevent it from happening or at least be able to respond more effectively when it does. So key takeaways, uh, it's, it's critical that we, oh, I've lost my screen, I'm sorry. It's critical that we refresh this enterprise risk profile because it does change. It's critical that we look at third-party dependencies and their resiliency plans as well. Had this been done, the PPE issue would not have been a, such a, a, a big issue at the outset of COVID. We need to invest resources to create, test, and maintain comprehensive business continuity programs. It's key that this isn't a one person or one team function. We need to engage the board. We need to engage leadership. And if we want to make that happen, one of the most effective ways is to connect these initiatives to departmental KPIs and MBOs. So. Great, many thanks. <clears throat> risk management, uh, which is typically a, a one-day boot camp, distilled down into 15 minutes. Yeah, but uh, I think that opens the door for, for discussion and then back and forth because you cannot grab and get hold of every aspect. But I think the the the, <clears throat> the line from beginning to the end, the value chain um, aspect, focus on value chain, synchronizing uh, via governance and bringing it up to sea level, what you said at the end. I love to hear that, but um, we are not yet there. But fully agree because then it would also um, make a fundamental change in listening to the people because if it is up to the sea level then you're in need of listening to your experts in supply chain in operations or wherever because the people at front they will always know more than the leader because they are working with the details and you must yeah. accept that and just try to trust their counsel but I, I'd say, Thorsten, um, certainly there's a lot of organizations that aren't doing this, like you say. Uh, I, I can tell you firsthand, having gone through BCM exercises with some companies, that, uh, I mean, it, it does happen too. And if you're working with a good BCM partner, they're going to insist that at, at the table read for the, for the, the business continuity management policy, you're going to have stakeholders from all the affected parts of the business. In fact, the toughest people to get to these table reads are top management because they want to leave it to the frontline people and say that they'll deal with it. My argument is that it needs to be both. It needs to be cultural from the top down, but you need to really integrate that frontline as well to get that knowledge that you're talking about. Absolutely, I fully agree, but there's only one point if you need to do that, that we discussed also in the, the last two days and all, uh, this morning also with Cynthia um, about is the small and then medium enterprises also reflecting um, what Sarah said is, um, 
the afford of money. So um, as long as they cannot afford all this, we expect from them to do risk management, to do this, to that. Um, I don't think it needs to be expensive. Though, and, and, I don't think it needs to be expensive. I, I, I mean, yes, but the, the core principles of risk management are first understanding that the risk is there, and and I think it's just changing a mindset that rather than you know looking at who my cheapest supplier is, looking at you know this supplier is 10% cheaper on cost of goods. But if I haven't audited what it, what their resiliency plans are, what's the impact if they go down and how long do I have to go to get another supplier? So, I mean, Sarah was Sarah was agreeing early on that with this procurement piece, procurement people are, are superstars now. People are talking about them and, and they're confused. Like, well, no one ever talks about us. But this is what it's about. I don't think you have to spend a lot of money on this to be able to begin to understand where does risk come from and look at countermeasures. Can I jump in here? Um, I think that was a great presentation, by the way, Jonathan. Um, but going back to the SME comment, I actually was going to ask you about SMEs, anyways, because you know it's kind of where do they start? You 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 talked about a lot of different risk factors, and one of them that I wanted to point out was cyber risk, because that's becoming yeah. um, a much bigger topic and potential priority. So if you're an SME, maybe the better question is. Where do you start or what's the biggest priority and where do you work your way down that list? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so they're first, all a priority, I know. Yeah, well, <laughs> first I'd say I, I don't think cyber risk is becoming a risk. I think it, it's been a huge risk for, for a long time. Whatever. We're all We're focused on COVID, but the number of cyber attacks during COVID is up 400% since pre-COVID. It's not like other types of risk have taken a holiday just because we've got our hands full with COVID. Um, cyber is a big deal. What, what I'd say is, Sarah, there, there's individual SMEs who know some of these areas very well. Like InfoSec guys are gonna know exactly what you have to do to help safeguard you uh, and, and harden your endpoints and, and, and do all that kind of stuff. But when we're talking about risk in totality, um, there's there's a group of people, the designation is CIA, which sounds kind of cool. These are certified <laughs> internal auditors. Um, and, and internal auditors, really their job is auditing the auditors and finding risk in the places that it isn't been, it hasn't been called out on balance sheets or hasn't been identified by auditors. So risk professionals are out there. I'm not one. Uh, I have one on my team because it is so critical. But that's where I would start. Uh, and there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff out there that shows, you know, how to how to cascade some of these different types of risk down through the organization and, and where to really begin. But it, it, it again, it doesn't have to be a complicated or expensive undertaking, but it is something you have to do. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'd add on to that, John. Um, it's pr possibly over a timeline more expensive not to have analyzed for risk than Absolutely. to go in without having taken the time to realize where you could fail. It's, it's like going ahead with projects when you're failing without picking up the learnings. So with John on that one, it's it's it's, it's not an or, it's but a when, yeah. how far can you go it's without often, having access to your risks. The, the people who are the biggest evangelists of risk management are usually people like me that have been burned. I mean, I was in the <laughs> Japanese automotive industry and lived through Sendai. We we lost a facility because of the earthquake and, and, the, uh, and the tidal wave. And then, you know, the board in Japan was saying, oh, well, why wasn't there a contingency plan in place? <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's really effective question to ask now that it's happened. Um, but I think, you know, for people who haven't actually felt it, we can give this great advice. And yeah, sure, it makes sense. But when they go back to their board, it's pretty difficult to to understand just how critically important it is to be ready in advance unless you've been burned once already. And that's if there's a silver lining to COVID, it's that globally, there are very few people who haven't felt the impact of this. Hopefully it's gonna drive some change. Lawrence, any comments from your side accordingly? Yes, I mean, there's, I'm always sort of somewhat nervous to mention about you know positives out of COVID because there isn't any positives uh, that really are worth talking about, but there are some silver linings. And I think, you know, the fact that, you know, for the last five years, my vernacular has included PPE. Now everyone in the world knows what PPE is and everyone in the world knows what a frontline worker is. So I think there has been some awakening. Um, and when we talk about risk, if you just sort of boil it down to, you know, employee safety. So in industrial companies, employee safety has always been 
you know, on the agenda for sure. But the existential risk of employee safety in terms of your operations and legal implications are so paramount now that I think, you know, that's going to change people's view on risk, particularly around employee safety, because it's it's always been important. But now it's like you must leave no one behind. It's like it's, it's yeah. a KPI. You can't leave anyone behind on, on risk because the risk on your business is now existential. It's always, as you said, you, you balance risk. Well, what's the probability? But now the probability is so high and the implications are so high that I think the case is closed. So I do think particularly around safety, um, the, you know, the risk case is closed. Any further comments from anybody of you? Otherwise, I have a lot of questions to you, but Great. I would need to stay. <laughs> Sarah, it looks like to have another question. Me? Yes. Oh, no, not really. No, I was just going to uh, agree with him on the, the uh, supplier diversity and, and how COVID mm. has really shown collaborative opportunities amongst the suppliers in the different tiers. Um, especially from like I was talking to somebody the other day and it was around payment terms, you know, just something as simple as payment terms and being able to collaborate around that and make it make it so that, you know, they can stay in business and you can stay in business and everybody can kind of work together. So it was just a comment. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so I would just uh, like to come back to, to the, the other statement with a small and medium companies where I uh, disagree a little bit with you. Yeah, it must be not um, expensive fully confirm, but however, the people need to get started. And, and um, at the moment, also the, the small companies, they are the most easiest to go bankrupt. And now we ask them about, you need to implement risk management, you need to do that and that and that and that. Or is it a limitation that was the point where we discussed about with Cynthia this morning that only the big companies will do business to business in future because the smaller are not able to keep up with all this, what they are now asked to be done at the same time. No, I. I... With respect, I disagree. Um, okay. Risk management and business continuity management can be as complicated as you can make them, um, just like any part of business can be. I mean, uh, there are plenty of small businesses that are getting by without having cutting edge ERPs or MRPs. Would they be better off with it? Certainly they would. They would be less wasteful, they would be more effective, they would be more agile, they'd be better able to respond to customer needs, but they can do without it but they need some sort of planning, otherwise they will go out of business. I would argue it's the same case with risk management. Um, you don't need a, a top tier, cutting edge, best in class risk management policy to, to learn from the, I mean, let's take a step back. When we're talking about risk management, what are we talking about? We're talking about recognizing that bad things can happen and recognizing where those bad things can happen and taking a few thoughts in advance of, if this bad thing happens, what should I do? And it can be as simple as that. And, and, and I would argue, Thorsten, that there are very few companies, small, medium or otherwise, who aren't now thinking about what might happen if my primary supplier goes down. What might happen if I have another major supply chain disruption? Uh, if a company can, can be in the midst of, of COVID and not recognize that this type of thing might happen again and they should plan for it, they are going to go out of business. But they probably should. Okay. Fully agree. Yeah, thank you. Because we also were thinking about, and that was the point you said, value chain. It's the first time uh, in the whole conference where we're looking more a little bit on the value chain point. We discussed it a little bit, tier one, tier two, tier three supplier. That is what we're talking about in the end, that all get connected. And, and there we have things like blockchain and uh, cybersecurity and all this other stuff in there. But um, that is just the point. Have you then to, to mitigate risk or, or ensure that also you know about the relationship between the tier two, tier three supplier? Or um, how is it? Um, that, is a, that, is a, that is a phase for sure. But again, going back to your earlier question, if I'm a small company and I don't have the capacity for doing that, then not looking at the relationship between stage two and tier two and tier three means I'm leaving something in an intentionally unknown, unknown bucket. If I've got the capacity, I can pull some of those unknowns, unknowns, and make them either known unknowns or known knowns. It's just how, how much appetite do I have for living with some of the variability and the risk that's in my value chain? How much appetite is a, is a, a good point. Um, Lawrence, how much appetite do you have in this regard? Yeah, so I, I think um, appetite is really about 
uh, you know, passion. One of the things that I think, uh, why I'm a great believer in, in the supply chain world is that uh, I think you find more passionate people uh, than you find in almost any other sector. You, know, you can go to a banking conference and you won't see many passionate people. But I do think uh, the, the passion of people, whether it's on the, you know, frontline workers or, you know, executives like Damo, I think there's just the passion for the subject gives me a lot of optimism that uh, some of these subjects will actually be delivered. Okay. So I think uh, that's also a perfect statement to the perfect time and right. So you're also now the next one to present. Absolutely. Okay. So a um, couple Come of quick, uh, quick things. Um, Damo mentioned, uh, in fact, several people mentioned, uh, uh, you know, checklist. I, I would highly recommend if you've got uh, some spare time to actually read this book from at all. Uh, it, it's, it's one of the first books I, I, I read uh, before I started to think about, you know, my company. Um, the checklist manifesto, and it just sort of takes you through a very, very well understood sort of path around if you enable people to do the job to the best of their ability with supporting information, um, good things happen. So I'd certainly recommend that. And then going back to the subject on, um, you know, it, it is uh, sustainability. You know, th this is one of my most recent investors, Princeville, and that they're investing in me out of their climate technology fund. And, and you'll see many, many, many investment funds around the world that are explicitly investing in, you know, the industrial world around sustainability. So I think there's some, you know, some really good things happening out there and you know, certainly recommend everyone uh, jumps into this. So let me, um, let me sort of take you on a little bit of a, a journey um, around how people sort of think about this subject and of Industry 4.0. You know, th this is a subject that's been you know, pretty pervasive over the last uh, few years. It's actually origination is uh, is from you know some of the industrial powerhouses in in Germany, um, and you know a lot of people have been sort of thinking about you know industry 4.0 and digital transformation, and they immediately think about you know how do I get more robots? Uh, how do I get more automated machines? Don't get me wrong, the the role of machines and automation is obviously very very important, but you know my, my whole philosophy uh, personally and also as a company is that. You know, the single biggest thing you can do to get people to do jobs right every time is actually give your humans, you know, modern digital tools. And this is really where, you know, we, we think there's a, there's a tremendous opportunity. And a couple of comments uh, during this session and also throughout the event is around, you know, you've got massive companies like, you know, Coca-Cola and then you've got, you know, small businesses. Um, some of these technologies that are available now, like, you know, connected worker platforms actually do have the ability to span massive enterprises and small businesses. You know, if you think about the, the world of SAP, which uh, when it started in, you know, in the sort of 90s, uh, really accelerating, um, it was really, to some extent, discriminating towards the very, very large companies and some of these other technologies. But there are increasing technologies which literally can be, you know, scaled for, you know, tens of thousands right down to, to 10 people. And talking about risk, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I really fundamentally believe about this year is that uh, it, it's been a, you know, a very, very harsh awakening for, you know, the world of manufacturing supply chain. And, you know, I think the ability to, you know, to be more agile, the ability to, to change quicker is, you know, is, is here forever. Um, I mentioned on my keynote on Monday some amazing things I saw in the industrial world, such as, you know, Henkel and L'Oreal switching production lines from, you know, beauty care products to hand sanitizer. You saw in the US Ford and General Motors that were shut down in the auto space, suddenly reopening to, to, to manufacture ventilators. So I think this, this need to change is really been highlighted. And I think the stakes are just too high if you don't take this seriously, because the agility you need to drive commercial outcomes is clear, but the agility you need in terms of risk mitigation, I think is, uh, is, is really, really important. And, th and there's so many supporting you know, factors. And obviously, you know, COVID-19, the pandemic has sort of you know, highlighted these, but there's many, many other things that are going on. You can probably talk to Damo about the change in buying behavior during you know, COVID, where people have sort of gone back to buying you know, two liter bottles, of, of, whereas in, in, the, in the past you know, year, they were going down to very, very small small sort of units. So sort of skew changes and this whole, you know, dynamism that's sort of impacting the world is, is here for forever. And, you know, uh, going back to this whole risk subject, um, you know, when we've sort of spoken to our customers um, and just broadly in the market, you know, one of the things that the pandemic has really done is, is highlighted and to some extent, extent exposed, you know, that the way that we've been operating in supply chain and manufacturing 
um, for the last uh, decade or so, even though we have made significant improvements, has still really highlighted you know, many, many inadequacies. And there's just you know four here, and I, and I won't read them all, but the, the ones that I think are you know really, really important is it, to me is if you think about the, the compliance, you know, one of the challenges with traditional sort of paper-based procedures or paper-based checklists is that you can just, you know, pencil whip them. Um, you don't really know what's gone on. And, you know, we don't want to talk too much about uh, COVID, but all of these pandemics, whether it's bird flu, whether it's SARS, whether it's MERS, whether it's uh, uh, mad cow's disease from my country many decades ago, it's all related to cross-contamination in the food chain. And one of the things that technology can do is actually make sure that this cross-contamination doesn't occur by putting in, you know, technology. So I think that the exposure that uh, COVID has put on traditional operations, I think, is is really, really important. And, and why has it exposed them? It's not that there hasn't been progress, but if you think about, you know, paper, um, you know, I really do hope that by the end of next year, we won't see one 10 centimeter binder in any manufacturing organization because the technologies exist and inherently they're out of date, they're dusty, they don't get looked at. Um, and they cause just waste because people actually don't know what to do, particularly in a time of a crisis. And I think, you know, paper is an obvious one. The second one, tribal knowledge, you know, this is a really interesting one, particularly with the demographic shift. You know, a 30 year veteran um, in, uh, in Coca Cola. Uh, European partners knows how to do a line changeover to switch production from one pack size to another pack size, almost with their eyes closed. If you're a new generation employee uh, that maybe has had some basic training and now your supervisor is actually not in the factory today, you know, you can't rely on that tribal knowledge. So I think, you know, digitizing this tacit knowledge is really, really important. Um, a lot of homegrown systems have just turned out to be too complex. You know, we saw so many companies scrambling around safety um, with like building things in, you know, in Microsoft tools. And yeah, they're all interesting, but they're just too complex. And then finally, you know, the world of enterprise software, which has been dominated in supply chain management systems and ERP, um, great system, don't get me wrong, but it just turned out to be too rigid. And I think this is really what's going on. And, and going back to this theme about automation, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about what I see in the world. And by the way, I'm a huge fan of Elon Musk. And, you know, he made this, uh, you know, fantastic statement. If you've been to the Tesla factory, you'll see huge amounts of robotic arms. And by the way, they're tremendously good at doing things like spot welding, far better than humans, actually. But you know, he made this statement that, you know, if you basically underrate humans, uh, do it at your peril. Um, and even more recently, you know, one of the great events during this year, very few good events, was the launch of SpaceX. And if you actually listened after the, uh, the successful launch, he made a a fantastic statement where he, he thanked 100,000 men and women that made it possible. And so really it's about taking you know, notice of what's really going on. And going back to the point, you know, there's some fantastic technology now in supply chain, um, in manufacturing. And today's truths are that the combination of sort of mechanical and process engineering expertise and having a minor in data and technology is really where the future is. And I think this is something we've really got to, got to you know, accelerate. Um, what, one of the most interesting things when people think about these sort of connected worker platforms is it's just a simple task of creating a digital version of an analog document. Um, but to some extent, that's really table stakes. And there was a couple of comments about metadata. One of the benefits of connected worker platforms and digital in its broadest sense is you actually get metadata where you can really understand what's going on. And you can also collaborate real time between you know, machines and humans through this metadata. So not just around moving to a paperless environment, you start to understand really that the role of digital in frontline work starts to become really, really transformational. And, uh, you know, great to hear about, uh, you know, Toyota experiences, because, you know, one of the tremendous things that I've always thought about manufacturing supply chain is that they've uncovered amazing you know, new generations of how to improve things over many, many decades. Um, for those of you that, you know, know Deming, you know, the father of, uh, you know, the Toyota manufacturing systems and some of the, you know, areas of continuous improvement. One of the benefits of these modern digital tools, if you think about the cycle of, you know, digitizing the standard operating procedure, then using execution to collect and push data to humans, take that data to measure how to improve the process and then transform it. It's effectively the same concept of the Kaizen suggestion box. 
The difference is he's now moved it into the modern world of digital, uh, modern world of mobile, and therefore the cycle times of how you actually impact a Kaizen becomes like warp speed. And this has been really, really highlighted during the pandemic when people have really needed to shift, make their shift patterns different, make their operations different. I think it's, it's really, really exciting. The, the other key point, um, again, going back to very large companies like Coca-Cola and maybe small businesses, um, a lot of these modern digital tools, uh, particularly around these connected worker platforms, actually are, are disintermediating the need to wait for IT to help. The benefits of really doing a blank sheet of paper approach to building products, which is what we did, is that you can start, start to go and talk to people that are really doing the work and then design solutions that actually anyone can use. So if you know how to create an email, you know how to build a PowerPoint, you understand the process, you can, with these no-code environments, just crank out dynamic standard operating procedures. And I, and I focus on the term dynamic, meaning they're not a point in time. They live, they breathe as you execute them. And I think this is what's uh, really exciting. And then as you start to execute, um, you get data and you do it through devices that people are, are familiar with. So when we started our company, unlike most enterprise software companies, we sat down and said, okay, let's think about the user in rather than the enterprise out. And what ultimately came out of this is, is a consumer-like design because a 30-year veteran, believe it or not, does know how to upload a picture to Facebook and he knows how to send an SMS to his daughter in university. Think about the other extreme of the workforce, uh, generation you know, Z or millennials, they know how to upload a video to Instagram and send a text message by WhatsApp. So that's the common denominator, which is make it like any other solution so that people feel comfortable and that the training gets down to almost you know, minutes, maybe half an hour, not the normal, let's sit in the classroom for three or four days. Um, and then most importantly, when you think about where these solutions can really help, particularly in the world of, you know, that we live in today, it's unlocking what we call dark data, which is the, the data that you see in enterprise systems and then where the work really occurs. You've got this sort of area of you know, fuzziness. You don't really know what's gone on. If you think about maintenance, you know, the maintenance management system will say, go and maintain that machine. You look inside the system and said it was maintained. But actually, did the work actually occur? And this data you start to unlock is, is really inspirational. And, and then finally, you know, it, it's really interesting if you think about, you know, the growth of Microsoft Teams or, um, you know, Zoom or even uh, the product we're using today during COVID. Um, you've also got the ability right down at the front line level to actually have this, you know, integrated collaboration. So you can be doing, doing work and actually you've forgotten something or maybe there's something that looks out of the ordinary in terms of what you should be doing you can real time collaborate with a colleague that actually could be at home or in another factory and that can be done like real time in a secure environment and, and a lot of these principles have been around the consumer world it, the, the reality is that you know silicon valley that's you know where i live has, has spent the last two decades you know developing software for the 20% of the world that sits behind the desk, um, the 80% that's actually out in the field or in the distribution centers or manufacturing sites hasn't really been given that level of technology. Now these sort of consumer-like ease of uses are working their way into this, uh, this environment. And then going back to the risk subject, you know, one of the things that uh, I mentioned in terms of risk is, is, is safety. And there's been safety sort of technologies around for many, many years. They're, they're typically you know, digital versions of, you know, safety checklists. The benefit of doing this at scale is you can actually start to see data real time. Think about things like safety crosses or behavioral safety observations, which many, many industrial companies believe in. The fact that you can now unlock this data real time and see comparisons between sites gives you a significant opportunity to drive safety to the masses as opposed to just episodically. And, and this is a really interesting fact. We have seen an amazing amount of data that highly correlates productivity with safety. If, if a worker executes work safely, almost certainly quality is going to go up. Therefore, rework will go down and ultimately productivity will, 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 will survive. And then this other concept of collaboration, um, you've also got this ability to start building communities. You know, think about supply chain collaboration, which has been talked about for decades. It's predominantly around sort of back-end systems. 
one of the benefits of these technologies now is you can actually do human to human supply chain collaboration. So something leaves my distribution center uh, in Mannheim in Germany and arrives in a distribution center for a, you know, a grocery store. Um, and there's an issue. They can real time collaborate. They don't need to go into the enterprise system. They can actually real time collaborate. So for remote inspection. So really exciting things. I think putting these technologies into the hands of, uh, of the worker. And then really just bringing this to a close, the other really important thing that uh, COVID has really changed, if you think about the traditional approach to technology in supply chain or manufacturing, you've literally looked at, let's do a waterfall plan for the next two years. Let's deploy this site, then that site. And three years later, you know, technology's changed and we've only got halfway through the implementation. So we really, really suggest people to don't overcomplicate it. Think of a few use cases. Think, of, how can I get started tomorrow? not next week or next month. And one of the benefits of uh, COVID for my business is that, you know, we're 100% remote deployments. And, you know, there's so many places you can look at. And, and one of the key things is to start to think about, well, how do I get started? And, you know, we often look at these various use case maps. There's hundreds of areas. In fact, there's thousands of places you can sort of insert connected worker platforms, figure out the value and the time to deploy, pick up two or three, get them deployed in a couple of sites in, in, in certain shifts and then iterate through it. And then you start to find that it really does self learn and then it starts to spread and people start to see the value. So think small to start with and then iterate uh, through it and start to sort of tier these use cases so that you don't sort of get daunted by the fact there's thousands. Think about which ones can really add value, less complex, fast to implement and then work your way through it. So really think agile in terms of how you deploy these types of uh, solutions. And, and what really is amazing for me um, is that, you know, as COVID started to kick in, particularly in Europe in March, several of our customers reached out to us and said, look, is there any reason why we couldn't, you know, adapt Passable's connected worker platform for, for worker safety? Safety was already a big use of pace for us. But within a week, we got hold of the CDC and WHO you know, operating procedures, we created metadata versions of them, we tested them out internally, we created dashboards, we pushed them out. In the traditional enterprise world, that would have taken weeks and months. Um, the mm -hmm. benefit now is you can do this literally real time. And then really sort of just finish you off, you know, um, one of my greatest stories, you know, is, is uh, one of our customers here in, the, in North America, the auto market, you know, shut down. Um, as they started to go back, um, they really wanted to focus on worker safety and risk around worker safety. So they started to use, you know, connected worker platforms to deploy, you know, thousands of users to make sure they were doing pre-screening before they came to work. Um, and this was really something that the workers really appreciated because it showed that the company was taking the subject seriously. And then obviously, you know, uh, money is important, uh, margin is important, and you can see how these platforms can deliver margin. But that's a that's a quick whistle stop tour. Hopefully, you found that useful and. Uh, back to uh, the panel. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. Um, <laughs> I get a, a lot of questions on one hand. On the other, I think uh, we even have a um, question in the chat box, which was uh, at the end of, of Jonathan's um, slot, um, and you answered some of that. So I, I just start with a, a simple question. The end of your presentation, it looks quite simple. Start from the small, grow to the uh, big. Um, so I would like to, to point out two questions. Why are certain companies deploying connected worker platform currently faster than others you're referring to? And how do frontline workers accept that? Yeah, so probably a good question to ask Damo. Um, you know, ultimately the reason okay. why people, you know, why is one company deploying faster and another one is deploying slow? It's related typically to two things. Number one is, is their digital maturity curve, meaning how have they been thinking about digital? Are they just starting? Or did they actually do the basics a few years ago? So it's where they are in the curve. And then secondly, perhaps the most important thing is just how they're organized from a change management perspective. You know, if you've got someone that's a, that's passionate, that can, you know, move away all the noise. Uh, so it's, it's change management. The people that are deploying fast, you know, in one company versus another, it could be identical companies. Are those, that have, those that have realized actually change management, I need to break down barriers. I need to simplify. And I need to drive these solutions with passion. So it's really about change management is the is the difference. Um, in terms of worker acceptance, you know that that's a really great uh, question. Um, you know when we started really deploying at scale a few years ago, perhaps one of the biggest objections would no one will use this. You know the 30 year veteran. You know it's not a, it's, well the reality is 
if you give them the clunky enterprise software they've had for the last two decades, absolutely they won't use it. You've got to motivate them and show them, actually put it in the palm of their hand, push the device over and say, just pick it up and see if it works. And then when they start to see actually it's not another clunky piece of software, and then you actually start to say to them, look, it's actually to help you make your work better. It's, yeah, there's a derivative benefit for the company, but they're having to do a lot of this work anyway, this busy work. They have to go back into a system or they have to build pieces of paper out. So it's a combination of put it in their hands, let them play with it so they don't feel daunted. And secondly, explain to them actually it's going to make their life better. The fact that it makes the company's life better is, is good, but it's actually going to make their life better. So it's really focusing on, on the user as opposed to on the technology. So, so that you may want to comment right? on that. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, can, I can absolutely second what Lawrence said in practice. Um, starting with the second question first, uh, user acceptance is definitely a case of what's the kind of NPS we are getting from the users, right? So Lawrence knows this. When we started it off in our pilot, we basically gave it to the users and said, give it a shot. Tell us what you think. Tell us what you would like to improve. The first improvement suggestions that came, Lawrence's team sat down with us, they sat down with some of the content providers and helped us build in those changes. So the, the, the team who was testing became part of that change and they were internal promoters. They basically said, this is cool. We have, we have got all of our knowledge mapped onto that system now. And so literally we had, Lawrence knows this, we had the other side of the case of management going, why are you going that fast with all those changes? We just wanted to test it and now you have four plants asking for it. Now we are going to 10. Can you slow this down? So I think it's it's about how you how you create that environment. You can get it instead in of a top-down push. But, but we decide this is the ERP software that's going to revolutionize, and we think it's going to change the system. And the CEO basically communicates downward. You can have it bottom up if you know who your multipliers are, and if you know how to engage them, and to make it an experience that's actually capturing. So you also need the right partners to be able to sit down with you and pick up the suggestions and do it. I mean. It, 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 it doesn't work any other way. So so that's one. This other one, I think the, the, the rates of speed of who are doing connected web worker platforms faster or slower, I wouldn't want to judge, but all I can say is I think it's, it's, it's also a strategic choice. People who are looking at digital transformation as a buzzword are usually looking at trade-offs all the time. Uh, and the others who are basically saying, look, there is, it's not a question of if it's a question of when, and let's let's get through it. Um, I think the German saying brings it uh, better in. It says uh, it's 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 better to have a hard and quick change than have a long and forever lasting pain. Um, okay. so, so 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 that's that 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 clarity of intention at the management level helps. If you know that you're gonna do this. It's for the people, then you give it to the people and let them decide when they're going to do it and how they're going to do it. If you have that courage, you usually go faster. So, yeah. <laughs> Jonathan, you were nodding your head intensively. So how is it with fast and slow um, pace? Hold well? on one second. Lawrence, you're still showing your screen. So I just want to let you know that you're still sharing your screen. There we go. OK, sorry. Didn't mean Thank to interrupt. You. I didn't know you. Thanks, <laughs> Shame, Sarah. I was, I was enjoying reading. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, basically everything that Damo was saying. What I'd add on is um, for, for people talking about SNOP, um, it's, it's times like COVID that people want to start talking about, you know, can we run our, our planning cycles weekly? Can we, can we respond to customers' needs more frequently by updating our forecasts more frequently? And uh, to me, in the absence of what what tools Lawrence is talking about and what Dan was talking about, it's an exercise in futility. You can you can plan for your customers' needs daily if you want to, but if your factory is set in a monthly or longer cadence and it doesn't have the ability to react faster than that, sure, you're, you're going to see changes in your demand signal much more quickly, but it's not actionable. So technology like this is very exciting because it, it starts to move that that big monolithic mechanism that has been the factory floor forever at a different pace because for a long time irrespective of the technological changes that have happened we've been locked in the same cadence because our ability to execute to the end hasn't really changed that much but now we're seeing it start to and i think the the other um the other piece that i think is critical and and you both touched on it is making evangelists of the end users because factory floor people um, know what they're doing and they don't love being told by head office, 
this will help you do your job better. They've been doing it for 30 years. They know what they're doing. And being pushed a new technology without being consulted infrequently goes well. Um, but, but making them partners and making them stakeholders and showing them, like Lawrence said, the benefit here is about you, not the company. The company benefit is secondary. And yes, it will happen. But this is about making it easier for you to do your job. What do you think? This is the way you begin to win hearts and minds on the shop floor and really make a success of some of these projects. I think one key element is also this is access to know-how. So the, the workers, they can simply write the instructions. So also for the youngsters, if I'm off, I know they can access my know-how. If there's some emergency, you can access it easily. I think that is one of the positive aspects also here where exactly what you said, there is the benefit in that they can really trust in their colleagues because their know-how is shared when needed. And, and you don't need to have the big SNOP uh, structure in mind and then um, need to read a book before you um, get the emergency under control. Huh? So, um, Matsera. I am on mute. I didn't know how much time we had left. Yeah, we have, we have sufficient. Don't worry. A couple of minutes? Okay. Um, great presentation. I really like what you guys are doing over there. Um, I liked what you were talking about, you know, minor in data and tech, because it's something that I talk a lot about when we're talking about supply chain talent and some of the skills that we need to take a look at, you know, moving into the future. One of the things at the beginning of your um, presentation was about how we have, you know, um, expertise and knowledge that is leaving the supply chain industry and then you've got the next generation coming in so my question to you and it doesn't have to do with your tech I apologize for that but how do we bridge that gap because there's there's a really big gap between supply chain programs and the companies that are hiring them because they want on-hand experience but then you've got this really big gap on the other side and and I just I just wanted to ask you if you have some sort of ideas around how we bridge that gap because it's really something that is a risk, Jonathan. It's something that's definitely a risk to our industry, and uh, we need to th we need to think about very very soon. Yeah, so um, it, it's a it's a fantastic uh, question, and you know something that uh, we could discuss for a long time because if you think pre pandemic, um, if you were looking at Davos and the, the World Economic Forum, there were two mega themes that were discussed there. The first one was sustainability, which is, is obviously super important. The second one was the future work. And if you sort of look at it, the future work is around, there's not, a, there's not enough workers. So I think, look at any of these statistics, um, it's becoming you know very close to being another existential risk. There's no one to do the work. Um, Think about the logistics uh, business, you know, Amazon doing tremendous amounts of investment in technology and also hiring 300,000 people, you know. So the, 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 there's a fallacy that automation is replacing jobs. It's replacing certain jobs that no one wants to do. It's creating many, many more jobs. Um, so it's an existential risk. I think there's, there's a, a number of initiatives going on. Um, the World Economic Forum is driving something called the new generation of manufacturing leaders, which is to start to propagate the opportunities in manufacturing supply chain. Um, I think companies are starting to really take it seriously in terms of how do they make it a place to work. And then in certain countries around the world, Germany is a, is a great one. China's a, another good example of really inv heavily investing in, you know, K-12 education and, you know, university education to have very specific vocational focus on manufacturing and supply chain. So it, it, it's certainly, an, a, you know, a, a very, very big risk. And, you know, you don't need to be a math expert. Um, it's a uh, an exponential risk because as every year goes by, your time is running out on both sides. Um, I do believe that most of the executives around the world in manufacturing have data in terms of demographic split and age split within their employee base, and they have the numbers. I think it's upon us all to shout very loud that supply chain and manufacturing is a great place to work. And it's also a great place to work because there's some fantastic technology. If you think about the shipping industry, I mean, it's one of the most traditional, you know, tacit knowledge, clipboards. Uh, there's now technology that can make that actually a pretty exciting industry. So it's a, it's a big risk. You know, we're doing our own piece, but I think the world's starting to realize that actually there's a lot of opportunities to fill unemployment gaps by driving vocational training into the supply chain and manufacturing. So I think it's a very, very big opportunity, although it's also a risk. 
Okay, so I, 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 I'm sorry that I now have to interrupt here um, because we're close at an end. I, I would love to listen to all of you much longer, but that was the intent that uh, we just uh, waken the hunger at the people. Um, however, we still have one chat question, but it's uh, more related to Jonathan, but also you had some elements in there, um, Lawrence. So I read that question and um, maybe the two of you can answer that. And after that, we will be closing, even if it means we extend five minutes we have an after-show workshop. I will explain then afterwards. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you for such intriguing presentation. However, in the business, we usually use Pareto 80-20, which means there are still 20% that senior management take as a rewarding risk. Startup experience, even bigger risk. What do you think about SpaceX? Thank you. <laughs> uh... Wow, uh, the, the SpaceX to me is a bit of a non sequitur, but but let me go back to the, the middle of that uh, comment and say, I, I don't see the however as a however. I mean, that was in fact my point. Um, there are infinite risks. We can't manage the infinite risks. What we can do is begin to quantify and identify the risks and then make strategic business decisions around where are we best able to put our focus first. And that was what the heat map was about. I apologize. I, I spent 20 or 30 seconds on it because the time was coming up. But yeah, I mean, it, it is a Pareto or, or, or a flavor of a Pareto. You're, you're going to manage what matters and manage what you have the capacity to manage. Um, what do I think of SpaceX? Uh, well, I'll say this. Um, if, if that question is being asked within the context of, yes, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in a program like this, one of my favorite um, one of my favorite programs to talk about when I'm talking to to companies about uh, not only risk management but goal goal setting is the Apollo program uh, because when you think about when the Apollo program was envisioned, we're talking about the 1960s where we had just begun to master solid and liquid fuel rocketry. We certainly hadn't put anyone on the end of it. We hadn't even put animals on the end of it. And Kennedy said, by the end of this decade, we're going to land a man on the moon and bring him back safely. I mean, when you think of this within the context of corporate management, any risk averse company would say, you're nuts, fire this guy. We, we have, like, we don't even know where to begin. We don't have the technology to do this. But this is why, and we've heard this in each of the presentations this morning, this is why culture is so key. When, why I'm arguing that risk management shouldn't be a dictate from management. It should be cultural because if culturally we're all bought in to the common place this organization is going and we say we're going to land a person on the moon and bring them back, it isn't a question of what today is possible. It's this is the goal. We work backwards from that. We understand the risks. There were risks. I mean, they had to course correct multiple times over the course of, of, of that program. But the risks within the context of the goal were called out and we're acceptable. What, what isn't appropriate is to accept unknown risks as appropriate and, and move ahead despite them. Uh, so what, bringing that now back to SpaceX, I, I hope I've understood the question properly. Yes, there's risks and, and, and the risks are great, but I think what we've learned from the previous space programs is we know where a lot of the risks are. And as long as we're able to identify and quantify those risks and collectively agree on them and to agree uh, and agree on how we mitigate them, then the determination, at least from SpaceX's view, is those risks are acceptable within the context of what the ultimate goal is. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> I, I I thank all of you. I think each of you maybe some 30 seconds closing remarks, comment on the panel, the key takeaways for you and for the audience, maybe starting with ladies first. I knew you were going to do that. Um, well, I, the one comment I have on the SpaceX is that's going to take logistics to a whole nother level. Anyways, some key takeaways for me um, was really just, you know, some of the stuff that I had mentioned earlier, um, what Lawrence was talking about, the, the gap and, and how the solution to really um, bridge that gap because that needs to be done ASAP. Um, what Jonathan was talking about, you know, as far as the risk and making it a priority and figuring out how to do that as an SME. Um, and then demo, um, you know, checklists and innovation. We've got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. 
<laughs> Okej, <Okay>, det är bra. Nej, så tror Well put, Sara. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I think Torsten, I'll, I'll have to give um, Lawrence plus plus on what he said around. You have programmed us into a, a panel here because it was amazing to see where is entrepreneurship taking technology and its use in the supply chain and 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 Sara driving it apart from all those things you stand for for the rest of us Sara and then going over to where does where does learning where does culture where does where does the people aspect sit in in the in the, in, the, in, the, in that journey to John coming in and talking us through that risk is about culture it's not about a management mandate it's it's about understanding that it's inherent and it's we need to measure it and then nicely closing it off with Lawrence actually taking a, a very tangible approach to actually managing some of those risks that, that are measurable that are known in a way that it, it literally eliminates them without adding any any, any on cost in fact you, you get savings out of it so I think um, it's been an honor to be part of your panel and and I hope that the viewers are able to take something out of it too just as much as we did and mm -hmm. you still owe us dinner even if it's virtual <laughs> <laughs> oh. so Lawrence yeah so um, I guess on, on a on a downside it does make me realize how much I miss physical you know presence I think this has been very effective but I'd much rather be you know sat with uh, demo in berlin but um that, that's the one point but but overall you know my my sort of summary is this gives me a lot of optimism yeah you've got like super new technology companies like sarah that's doing some brown groundbreaking work in a very very traditional industry you, you know you've got jonathan who is um i'm sort of going to repurpose some of the things he said who's putting risk in the context of you know people used to say well it's a small risk and time risk adjusted it's bottom list where the timeline now for risk assessment is so different but you can turn it into opportunity. So, you know, the opportunity to take a more serious look at risk in terms of the upside, like if you ignore sustainability, you're in, it's a big risk. But if you embrace sustainability risk, you're actually going to get some benefit out of it. So I, I just feel very optimistic that we've got, you know, five of us all somewhat aligned that the future actually looks quite bright, even though right now the world's got some uh, some challenges. I, I feel very motivated that this is maybe a you know, a, a breakthrough to the next level of how people think about supply chain manufacturing and the, the, the future looks bright. And, and ultimately, it does come down to, you know, the people. We, we can all say things and we can coach people and we can motivate people. But the more you can actually get the individuals to be self-enabling, that's how we get, you know, to a better place. So uh, summary, feel very motivated for the future by this, uh, this uh, grouping today. Jonathan. I think what's uh, what's so satisfying about working in supply chain is um, it's if we look at this panel as, as a microcosm of the people at this conference, we've got nearly every aspect of, of corporate governance covered. And that's because of supply chain is literally that thing that that connects enterprises and connects people. When I first made the move to uh, a, a company like a like an automotive manufacturer it was specifically because prior to that i was in i was in finance and you guys were beating up on on bank but i i worked for one um and we were very good at at what we did in terms of analytics but to me it wasn't tangible and what was so exciting about working for a manufacturer was that at the end of the day what you're doing is is having a tangible effect on people's lives what we used to say we're literally making the wheels that that uh, move the trucks in the economy um and that's what's, that's what's cool about this panel. You've got uh, the topic is ostensibly supply chain, but we've covered nearly every part of the enterprise because supply chain does that. Um, and it was a real pleasure to be able to be part of the panel with the with you, Thorson, and, and the other co-panelists. Thank you very much. But that exactly was the intent uh, intent to, to step out of the traditional viewpoint of supply chain, the, the operational guys who are sitting between hammer and anvil and getting operations hectic, the, the things out of the fire. That's not supply chain. I think also that is the topic supply chain of the future is the one where you can win the battle against the competition. Yeah? So it's more supply chain against supply chain and not uh, longer just my product counts. It's it's the entire integration. And therefore, I'm, I'm happy that you um, joined and have understood and also you brought that alive. It's just me sitting between you, but without your content, it wouldn't be working at all. And if you are not, can't get enough, we all see the screen here. We also have an after show uh, workshop now from um, 
now on, just started uh, with uh, Dr. Eric Jones and Marcel Vollmer, um, a networking reception on the right-hand side. You can see that on the screen. If you go there in the welcome center on the sctechshow.com, then you can go there in the Zoom. And we will award now uh, 25 supply chain influencers and also um, the people can meet the book authors, some of our book authors who are in the bookstore also listed. So we still have some program until eight o'clock. However, we extended a little bit um, the time, but I think that was more than worth doing it. I'm, I'm really honored that you joined and uh, a controversial discussion at some points and that is exactly what's needed. And, <laughs> um, and then we see if we can uh, start up the, the SpaceX of supply chain for the future for all the people all together. It's collaboration, that's what counts. And I think we have shown best practice for it to gay today all together. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Absolutely. Thank you, Sean, you guys. Bye bye. Have a nice evening. All. Thank and you. See, see you all. Exactly. Take care. Exactly. Bye bye. Bye bye.